<clears throat> thanks a lot. This is a great crowd. Thanks for coming out tonight. Um, when I was thinking about what I was going to say for this tonight, I came to the realization that in, in another year, it'll be 50 years since the first time I hit the record button on an Ampex tape machine. <laughs> and so I've been doing this for a long, long time. And the reason I was able to do that uh, 50 years ago, or almost, 49 anyway, was because I went to a high school that had a broadcast station, an FM broadcast station. In fact, it was the first uh, high school radio station licensed in the United States. And just by luck, I happened to go up to that school. And they had some of the world's best equipment in this place. It was just amazing. They had Ampex tape machines. We had a Collins console, we had RCA turntables, we had a GE transmitter, and a bunch of mics, including some RCA ribbon mics and, and stuff like that. So it gave us these tools to use as high school kids. It was totally amazing. And one of the things that, well, the radio station you know, did like normal kind of radio programming from back in those days, but we also broadcast school concerts, talent show, plays, anything like that, the band, any of that stuff, in sports events. And they, um, traditionally, for the years before I was there, they had a way that they set up to record these orchestra concerts in the school auditorium. And, you know, my background up to that point was hearing classical music in a real concert hall. Because my father played in the Philadelphia Orchestra and I used to go with him to the Academy of Music in Philadelphia, right? and sometimes it was for a concert, but sometimes it was just for a rehearsal. And I'd wander around the Academy of Music, and it was amazing to me how different everything sounded as you moved around that, that great hall. But at most places, it sounded really good. I also went to some of the recording sessions that they did, although they wouldn't let me stay there during the actual <laughs> recording. But you know, I got to see them set up. You know, two U-47s on giant stands. You know, that was basically the way they recorded an orchestra back in those days. And, you know, and I heard how that sounded. And when I got to high school, I said, well, I know how to do record an orchestra. You just put two really good mics up there, and it sounds great. Well, it sounded awful. <laughs> it sounded terrible. And that's when I realized that there's a lot more to it than just putting the mics up where you think they should go. And the problem was, it was a typical high school auditorium. You know, it had a concrete floor and cinder block walls, and it was just an awful sounding room. Um, but it was a challenge to me, because I said, I want to make this sound like what I'm used to hearing. You know, so I spent the three years I was in high school trying to make that sound right in there. And I was not totally successful, but I got it to sound a lot better than it used to the way we used to do it. And of course, this is in the 60s, so you had a lot of garage band kinds of people that wanted to be the Rolling Stones and the Beatles and the Beach Boys. And <clears throat> when I got this reputation for being interested in doing all this recording, all of a sudden all these people are coming to me and saying, can you record us? You know, so I said, all right, we'll give it a try. Well, I learned quickly you know, that there's a lot more to recording that kind of music than there was to recording classical music. And very limited. I had basically four or five mic inputs, and I had some great mics, but that's pretty complicated to do, you know, a rock band. And this is, we didn't have any facilities for doing any overdubs, except if you wanted to go generation to generation on the tape machines. So we basically had to do the whole thing live. And one of the things that really saved us or saved me, getting this stuff to sound halfway decent, was the fact that everything in that whole radio station was vacuum tube. And it was so forgiving, you know? You can make all kinds of mistakes and levels and stuff, and as long as you kept the level up enough that the meter was at least moving, you would always be sure of having something that, that would sound okay. And it might be noisy, and, it, you know, and sometimes it would go too hot, and you get a lot of tape saturation. But it was a way of recording that, you know, was what I was used to doing. Well, the radio station got a new console. And instead of this old uh, Collins console that was built probably 
I'm going to imagine early 1940s. We got a 1963 version of it. It was still all <laughs> vacuum tubes. And that was my summer project, was putting in this new console and rewiring everything, because the whole place had been wired with kind of crummy wiring over the years. So I did all that for one summer. And then uh, the next, that winter, um, we, well, let me back up a little bit. I was very fortunate that this radio station had a technical advisor who worked for one of the major Philadelphia radio and TV stations. And he made sure that we did everything like we were the CBS radio network. You know, it was, it was just amazing the way he would just absolutely insist that we do things right, up to the point of winding cables. You know? He would come in and he'd look at the cables and he'd say, who wound this cable? And he'd take the thing and he'd throw it down on the floor and he says, wind it up again. And he'd just make you keep winding it until it was perfect, you know? And I can still wind cables perfectly in my sleep. <laughs> um, but we learned a lot from him because he gave us that discipline of like, you do it right or you don't do it, you know? There's, there's, no, there's no halfway, you do it right. And because I had this experience of uh, doing this, and I had a first class radio telephone license, which is what you needed to work in a radio station at the time, I went to all the radio stations in Philadelphia during Christmas break and to see if any of them would hire me for the summer as, a, as an engineer. And I ended up, actually all of them offered me a job, but the station I decided to go to was not the top rated station in the city. And it was kind of old and run down, but it had certain characteristics. It just really appealed to me. Probably not a real good career plan, but it was like the place I wanted to work because that station had not, nothing really significantly changed in that place since 1946, the last time it was rebuilt. And it was built by RCA, and which is right across the river in Camden, New Jersey. And Almost everything in that place was made by RCA, uh, except we had a lot of Ampex tape machines, which were obviously not available in 1946 when it was built. They had disc lathes. You know, that's where I learned how to cut discs. It was there. And um, in this entire uh, facility of seven studios, um, from the microphone to the antenna, there was not a single solid state device. Everything was vacuum tube all the way through. And the consoles that they had, these old RCA consoles, were um, obviously vacuum tube, but the consoles themselves had no vacuum tube electronics in them at all. It was just basically a control surface, you could think of it as. And all the electronics were, were all in a rack racks and racks and racks of microphone preamplifiers. So they used basically the same amplifier for wherever they needed. It's a summing amp, it's a mic preamp, it's a phono preamp. They were all basically the same RCA design. So uh, just before I got there, they replaced the two main control room consoles with newer RCA consoles, which were still vacuum tube, but these used miniature tubes and they were able to integrate all the electronics inside the console, like a modern console. So they had all these racks full of RCA mic preamps that were no longer in use. And they just sat there for years and I didn't give it much thought. But when I started building a studio for myself, I said, well, you know, what I really wanted was an Electrodyne console because that was like the big console of the day. The only one really that was out there. Um, designed by the same guy that designed the API and, and, and several others of the, from that era. I couldn't afford that. So what did I do? I built a passive mixer and I talked to the chief engineer of the station and said, we don't use these anymore. You want to sell me some of these mic preamps? And he did. So I bought like a dozen of these mic preamps. They were in racks. The, each one, there were different models of them. Some of them held two, some of them held four. And uh, that's what I used for my mic preamps in my studio. Passive mixer to an Ampex uh, uh, four track uh, tape machine. And that was my initial studio. Well, 
that's a real pain. For one thing, it required patching everything because every time you had to reconfigure things, it just was a real pain to just change all the patch cords and everything. So eventually, I did get a console, and we solid state, of course, and we installed this console. We waited for a year for this thing to be built, and it finally was done. We put it in, hooked it up, checked it all out, and said, this is great. Look at this. I don't have to patch anything. I got all these faders. I got a million mic inputs. I got EQ. You know, I got pan pots. This is heaven. So we hooked it up, and we're starting to record some stuff with it. And you know, my first reaction was, wait, what's wrong? <laughs> this does not sound right. You know? And I said, is this really right? You know, and I took some measurements of the thing to say, is this thing working right? And yeah, it seemed like it met all the specs and everything, but it just sounded awful. And, you know, at that same time, I think a lot of people were going through that transition when they were replacing all their vacuum tube gear with a solid state console. And they just, you know, they said, it doesn't sound right. Well, the, the common explanation for that was, and this will sound familiar, you're just not used to hearing it in perfection. <laughs> you know? Where have we heard that before? <laughs> and so suddenly, you know, it's like, oh, well, we just have to get used to perfection because we're used to hearing this crummy vacuum tube stuff that doesn't sound right. This is what it's supposed to sound like. And so we sort of accepted that because it was convenient to have this console where you could do all this stuff and you didn't have to patch and you had pan pots and everything you needed was right there. But somehow in the back of my mind, even as I upgraded and went to 16 track and 24 track and got a bigger console and bigger rooms and all that stuff, there's just something in the back of my mind that says, you know, it still doesn't sound right. <laughs> and no matter what I did, you know, it just didn't sound the way I wanted it to sound. And at, at that point, running a studio is, is pretty much a full-time job, as a lot of people here can, can attest to. And the opportunity for me to take time off to build mic preamps or build a console or something like that just wasn't practical. So I didn't do anything with that. And I ran that studio for about 15 years or so. And then I realized that I was really getting sick of doing this because, and I'm sure a lot of you can relate to this as well, I got to the point where it was very rare for me to work with people that were as good as what they, what they did as I was at what I did. <laughs> and it's very unsatisfying when you're in a situation like that. And I knew it was time to get out of the business when I started being honest with people when they asked my opinion. <laughs> and, and I, so, so I, I sat there one day and I'm looking at this Studer 24 track in back of me and all these Dolby units and all this stuff and I'm thinking, you know, I'm living in an apartment. I could, I could sell that thing and buy a house. <laughs> Why am I doing this? You know? And that's essentially what I did. I said, I've just had enough of this. And I got out of the business and I didn't listen to music. I didn't record yeah. anything. I didn't have anything to do with it for years, for probably four or five years. I was just so burnt out by it. But then a couple of opportunities came along to record some classical and choral music in you know, pretty nice venues on location. And people asked me if I'd record it. I think the first one I did it was for a friend and he had some crummy equipment and he said, you help me set this up. And I did and we recorded it and played around with it and he was amazed that it sounded as good as it did. And I thought, well, you know, this is kind of fun. Maybe I could do this, you know, I'm just, Maybe what I'm burned out on is punching in background vocals till five in the morning, you know? And if I just had to go in and record a performance where it's done and I go home, maybe, that, maybe that's better. And so that's what I, what I started doing. You know, it's a sideline kind of thing. And as I'm doing that, I'm thinking, you know, I don't need many channels here. Most of the things I'm doing are just two mics, sometimes four mics, sometimes a couple more, but mostly it was just very straightforward stereo recording. And <clears throat> why don't I build a mic preamp? And I built some solid state mic preamps because I thought, you know, I should be able to do better than the crummy console mic preamps. I knew what they were made with. You know, a typical console 
mic preamp has five dollars in parts in it, <laughs> you know. So I built some solid state mic pre's and they sounded better and I was really happy with that. But it still wasn't what I was looking for. And one day, a friend of mine that I recorded back in high school and, and after that in my studio said, I have something you want, I want you to hear. And he had a tape that we had recorded probably in 1970. And that was with the studio with all the, the tube mic preamps and the passive mixer. And he brought it over and we put that thing up and I started listening to it and I said, holy cow, that <laughs> sounds really good. And I had no idea what I was doing at that time. Imagine what I could do today yeah. with that kind of sound. You know, so that was really the, uh, the reason why I decided to build a, a mic preamp. And I started out, and this was just for me, you know, I wasn't really going to sell these things. I just wanted it for myself. And um, so I said, well, you know, can I get tubes? Well, tubes were available. Can I get decent transformers? Well, Jensen makes good transformers. You know, can I get all the other stuff I need? Can you get tube sockets? You know what I mean? Is any of this stuff still available? And it was. And I said, you know what? I'm going to build this mic preamp. And I studied like the old RCA designs and everybody else's designs from back in those days. Alltech, Ampex had designs. Everybody did. And they were all a little different. And I would look at those things and I'd say, well, that's a good idea. But why'd they do this? You know, that's not a good idea. So I sort of took all these things and started building up stuff and listening to it and measuring it and, and you know, sort of pounding this thing into shape because uh, you can take an old design mic preamp and recreate that, but it's not necessarily the, the best thing you, that you can do with it. I mean, there's so much more you can do. It's like everybody in the, I think today, still to this day, the majority of audio design stuff sort of gets to a point where they say, yeah, that works. And that's it. They stopped there, you know? And I just wasn't interested in that. I wanted to sound better than that. So it was important to me to, to do that and build these things for myself. I contacted Jensen, asked them what transformers they had. And that, that really struck up a really interesting relationship that continues to this day. Because for whatever reason, something I said to them appealed to them. And they just felt, you know, this guy knows what he's doing. We're going to help him. And they put in so much effort into my stuff. It was amazing. Because what I wanted for like an input transformer was not anything like they had in their catalog. And what I wanted for an output transformer was they didn't even make anything that was like that. I mean, they, that was not their uh, catalog kind of stuff. So I told them what I wanted. And they make up a transformer and they send it to me and I'd hook it up and I'd say, yeah, that sounds pretty good. And I'd talk to them and say, and they'd say, well, you know, what do you like and not like about that? And I'd say, well, I really like the, the, the low end and the mid range are perfect. But the high end to me in my ear is a little brittle sounding. And they said, okay. And they'd tweak the um, alloy that they'd use for the core of the transformer a little bit, send me another one. So we went through, and oh, we didn't do that much. It was maybe five or six of those, and then we finally got to a point where it was what I wanted. It was what I was wanted to hear. And we did the same thing with the output transformer, which is actually a little easier than the input transformer. And uh, to this day, those are the designs we, that, that we developed in 1992. They're still exactly the same ones we use today. And they've been making those transformers for me <coughs> all that time. Well, I got this first one done and I actually a pair of them and I used them on some sessions that I did on, on location and I was really pleased with it. And I ran into a friend of mine who owned a studio um, and he says, hey, what are you up to these days? And like a fool, I said, well, I, you know, I was just doing some location recording and I just built some mic priests. Oh, really? What? Tell me about them. And so I said, well, they're two, you know, like steps back like, whoa, why? <laughs> why would you do that? And I said, well, I think it sounds better. And he said, I want to hear this. So I gave him one of those prototypes. And he's got it for a few days. And he calls up. He says, he says this thing's amazing. And I said, oh, good. I'm glad. glad there's somebody else in the world that hears like I do anyway. I figured that was the only explanation. And uh, eventually I said, you know, I really need that back. He said, no, you know, I don't want to give it up. <laughs> 
you know? And I said, well, look, I'll build you one, you know? Um, but I need that one back. So I got it back from him and I built it and I thought, well, maybe there is a market for this. And what I did initially, this is pre-internet days, you gotta remember, is I bought a mailing list from Mix Magazine. That tells you how long ago this is. I can't even imagine this now, you know? And they send me these, all these sheets with stick-on labels, you know? And I make up a little brochure and I send it out to, I sort of went through and sort of picked people that sounded to me like they might be you know, good prospect. So they sent me like a thousand names and I couldn't afford to send out a thousand of them. And uh, that generated the first batch of sales. And after that, it was, it was pretty much, we were pretty much on our own. And the first year at AES, we, uh, I contacted Fletcher at Mercenary and said, you know, I built this thing. He was real interested, very supportive all along. And he said, um, I said, yeah, I'd like to do the AES, but you know, I can't afford a booth, it's thousands of dollars. He said, well, come on, you can use a uh, corner of our booth. Mm -hmm. you know? So I paid him a fraction of the booth cost, and I sat there and I had a VT1 in like a, an anvil case, which I had used to carry it into the place. <laughs> and we set it up that way, and we had a lot of reaction to it. And from that first time through probably the next four or five years, everybody that would come up and look at that thing, and they were attracted to it because nothing else was red, you know? <laughs> Focusrite hadn't made any red <laughs> gear by then. And um, they would come up and they'd say, they'd ask me uh, three questions, always. I got the same three questions all the time. You can imagine what they are. The first one was, why is it red? <laughs> You know, and the second one was, why is it so big? <laughs> and the third one was, why is it so expensive? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, contrary to every manufacturing rule in the universe, I did not design and build this thing to meet a price point. I didn't talk to anybody about what they wanted. I didn't do any market research. I didn't do focus groups. I didn't even survey the market to see what, who else was doing anything else because this is what I was doing. It was just, that was it. And if you like it, fine. If you don't, that's fine too, you know? And uh, it, it, it just evolved that way. And because I wasn't willing to make any compromises in it, you know, it just got to be very expensive to build. And as I was designing the, the prototypes, I'm thinking, well, I can use a you know, $5 part here, or I can get something that, that's a little bit better, but not dramatically better, for $10. And I said, well, you know, really, I should just use the $5 part. But I couldn't do it. <laughs> I had to put the $10 part in because I knew it would make a difference. And my theory was, which I think I, I still believe in, is that if you have something that makes 1% improvement in the sound of it, probably nobody's going to hear that. But what if you have 10 of those? What if you have 20 of those? Then suddenly you're talking about something that's significantly better sounding. So that's basically the way I still design stuff. Is I, it's something I want for myself because I feel that I have a need for this particular thing in my own recording. And I'm going to build it without any compromise. And whatever the parts cost to make it right, that's what I'm going to put in there. And that's why it's so expensive. Why is it so big? Well, for one thing, I mount all the tubes vertically. They stand up straight because that's the way they were designed to go. Because when you put tubes on their side, several bad things happen. One is they don't cool properly, so the life of them is compromised. And the second is gravity changes the internal structure of that tube, especially as it heats up. And it changes the characteristics of it. In fact, I can hear the difference between one of these because when we test them out, they're upside down because we're checking voltages underneath, you know? It sounds different when it's upside down than when it's turned right side up. <laughs> I thought I was crazy, but it's really true. It sounds different. And so that's why it's so big. And the question is why it's red. When I originally uh, built the prototype, it was just it was a plain aluminum, natural aluminum front panel. And I thought, well, you know, if somebody's going to play with this thing, I ought to try and make it look a little nicer than that. So I went to the hardware store, and I sort of had in mind a color, sort of a blue-gray color, like the old 
Hewlett Packard test equipment. Any of you that have ever used any of that old, you know, before Hewlett Packard became a computer company, <coughs> they made precision test equipment. And the color that they used, their signature color, was sort of this gray with sort of a bluish tinge to it that I always thought was pretty neat. They weren't using it anymore. And I thought, well, that's a nice color. I think that's the way I'll paint it. So I figure I'm just going to paint this first panel by hand with a can of spray paint. So I go to the hardware store, and I'm looking, and there's sort of a gray that's almost it, and sort of this, and I'm looking at them. But I, my eye, out of the corner of my eye, there's a red. And I it just kept going back to that. And I said, you know what? I'm just going to use the red. I don't <laughs> care. That's the color I like. That's the way I'm going to paint it. So the first one, and in fact, if you look in that VT2 brochure, you will see the VT1 photo, which is on the inside, is the original VT1 prototype that I hand-painted <laughs> with a spray can, and uh, that became the, the color. Wow. And um, since that time, you know, it's become just well-known. It, 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 it's the red stuff, you know? <laughs> it's Red Tuesday today. Yeah, we got a lot of red here tonight. Well, after the VT1, the single channel mic preamp was out for a while. People were saying, you know, they wanted a two channel version of it, and I wanted that too. So that became the VT2, which is still the best selling product we've made. We just sell those very consistently year after year. Um, a few years later, I thought it would be nice to, to make an equalizer. When I sold my studio, I kept only a few things out of there that I really wanted to hang on to. And one of them was a pair of Trident parametric equalizers. One of them was a prototype and the other was a production version, but they were close enough that, that they were a good match, close enough to be matched to use as a stereo pair. And I love that equalizer. The things that it did on stuff was just phenomenal. It's all discrete transistors. And um, it was just one thing I thought I would never give up. And <clears throat> So that was sort of my goal, was to do something like that. And I talked to Malcolm Toft, who I got to know pretty well over the years, and I said, Malcolm, why don't you do something with this? I think that's just one of the greatest equalizers ever made. And he says, ah, you know, I don't, I don't really know. Do you think anybody would buy that? And I said, well, look, if you're not going to do it, license the design to me and I'll build them. He says, ah, I don't know if I can do it. Evidently, there's somebody else involved, too. I think that was the problem. And he wouldn't do it. I didn't want to reverse engineer it and build it. And I wanted to use tubes anyway. Um, but that was sort of this, the basic sound that I wanted to find. And so I started experimenting and built, I can't tell you how many prototypes of equalizers. And I listened to them all and I said, well, this is pretty good, but it's not really what I'm looking for. And um, what I concluded after a while was that a passive equalizer design was the, the way to go for me. That was the kind of sound that fit my sense of what it should sound like the best. In a passive equalizer, the equalization circuits are just, they, they could theoretically stand alone and do the job. You just need an amplifier stage to make up for the loss of the equalization circuits. That's the way Poltec did it and a lot of other people back in those days. And I thought that's really good, good design. I like the way that sounds. The, the problem with most of those old equalizers, the Pultec included, was that they had no isolation between the equalizer circuit and whatever was feeding it. That was OK in 1955 when everything was 600 ohms, because then the input impedance to the equalizer was always a known value. And the equalization was very predictable. But these days, there is no standardization, and it's actually a better way, the way we do it today, with a low impedance source, source impedance, and a high impedance bridging input. That's, there's a lot of advantages to that, but it doesn't make those old kinds of passive equalizers very predictable, because everything you patch into them likely is going to sound a little different. And so one of the things that I said when I do a passive equalizer is I'm going to definitely have an input stage that drives it with a constant impedance, so you don't have that problem. And as far as the actual equalizer circuitry is concerned, that's pretty simple. You know, that's stuff that Bell Labs figured out in the 1920s. And in fact, Bell Labs invented everything in audio, including digital. <laughs> <laughs> yes. they, have, they have articles in their journal on digital audio in 1932. They had no way to make it work. 
<laughs> but they had the theory down. You know, Nyquist, he was a Bell Labs engineer, you know, in the 1920s. So um, they, I found they published a table of um, inductance and capacitance ratios that they found worked best. Because you gotta remember back in those days, the radio networks were the primary source of entertainment, you know, mass entertainment in, in the country. And if you had an uh, NBC or ABC or CBS radio show in New York or Los Angeles, you had to get that program material to stations all over the country. There was no tape. You could put it on disc, but nobody really did that. They wanted it live. And the only way to do that was through phone lines. These are the exact same copper pair of wires that come or used to come into your house for your telephone. But the uh, Bell Labs engineers figured out how to make that work with program material so you could get, you know, they said 50 to 15,000 was their goal. They actually usually did it quite a bit better than that through a pair of twisted pair of copper that went 3,000 miles. So they knew uh, equalization. They knew how to amplify <coughs> stuff and they knew how to do it right. And when I went to those design tables, I said, well, why did they pick all these weird values? This is like really strange because in theory, there's an infinite number of combinations of capacitors and inductors that'll give you the exact same characteristic. But Bell Labs figured out, and I quickly confirmed it, that they don't all sound the same, even though theoretically they should. And there's certain ratios that sound really good and certain ratios that sound really bad. And that was really my um, guiding force for designing the VT4 equalizer, was to use those tables. And you know, I, in some cases, by necessity, I had to deviate a little bit from them and um, figure out what, what it was that sounded best. And the way that I did that was to listen to it. You know, I measured it just because I needed some measurements in order to um, sort of know where I was, so when I made a change, I knew which direction I was going. But ultimately, the design goal was to make it sound right. I mean, is that really <laughs> rocket science? It's just uh, common sense if you're designing something that you're gonna use to record audio. And so what I did was I would have the prototype of the VT4 and listen to it all day long while I was working on other things. And I would have clip leads coming out of that with all kinds of different values and inductance and capacitance I could clip in and change things all the time. And not only did that help me zero in on the frequencies that I thought were the most useful ones to my ear, but it also helped me to refine that ratio between those values that sounded best. And that's how the VT4 came about. But more, more so than any other product I've made, that product is designed by ear. And to this day, I've never measured the curves on this thing. <laughs> People ask me what it is, I say, oh, I don't know. It just, it's just the way it sounds right, you know? And as far as the frequencies are concerned, it was sort of, a lot of times, it's kind of arbitrary because the high and low frequencies are all shelving. And it's like, well, where do you pick the point where you define the frequency of a shelf, you know? So I just picked the 3 dB point, which is kind of a standard engineering thing. And whatever it turned out to be, I'd round it off to the nearest <laughs> round number. So when it says 100, it may actually be 96 <laughs> or 104, I don't know. <laughs> but it doesn't really matter because it sounded right to Sounds me. Sounds good. Yeah. So that, that was a VT4, which you know we continue to sell pretty well. But the mastering places, and we're using it a lot of times, and they would buy them in pairs. In fact, it turned out for a while we were selling them all in pairs. We never sold a single VT4 just by itself. And the mastering places were telling me, you know, you're killing me with six rack units of space for my equalizer. And I said, and they kept saying, can you build, you know, build one, it's all in one. Um, saying They weren't even smaller, but that's not practical. And um, I kept saying, yeah, I suppose that's possible, but I never really did much with it for a few years, but finally, I did build the VT5, which is the exact same circuit, doubled in there, so it has eight tubes in it. And it's a true stereo where the controls actually control both channels simultaneously, which is what the mastering places wanted. So ideally, um, 
And what I do is that when I have to do a um, uh, EQ a stereo signal of some sort, I use a pair of VT4s just because I just like having that versatility. And if you have two separate equalizers like that, when you're tracking, you can use them separately and so on. But for a lot of people, the VT5 is a better solution. It doesn't take up as much space. If all they're going to use it on is a mix bus or for mastering, then that's the, probably the better choice. Uh, I will tell you that the VT5 has a fan in it because it's a lot of heat generated with eight tubes. It's just a little tiny fan that we run at about half voltage, so it's, it's really quiet. But I do have some really, really picky customers who say, I can hear that fan. <laughs> um, so the VT4s, I say, OK, buy a pair of VT4s. They don't have fans in them. <laughs> um, and to complete the, the, the whole chain that I wanted, the next step was a compressor, which I have been working on for years and years and years. I have a shelf full of prototypes of compressors. And uh, some of them were kind of promising, others of them were real dead ends. Um, I didn't want to do like another LA-2A, I mean, I don't think the world needs another manufacturer making an LA-2A clone or anything even like that. Uh, so I wanted something completely different. And um, the way this came about was I was down in Nashville for some forum that, that a bunch of us were doing together including my friend Dave Hill from Crane Song. And Dave and I were having dinner, and we were talking about various things we were working on. And I said, yeah, I'm com trying to come up with a compressor that I like. And I had heard his STC-8, which I thought had some really interesting characteristics. It wasn't exactly what I wanted to do, but I started talking to him, and he says, oh, yeah, that's a, that uses a pulse width modulator. And I'm not going to go into the technical <laughs> details of that. but. Um, I said, well, that's really interesting because about six months before that, I had come across an article somewhere about pulse width modulators. And I thought, you know, you could use that technology to make a compressor. And David had already done it. He was like a year ahead of me on that. And I said, I said um, well, actually, Dave volunteered. He says, you know, I'll, I'll design that for you. And so the actual pulse width modulator control element in the VT7, what became the VT7 compressor, is Dave Hill's design. And it's, it's very similar to the control element in the STC-8. A little bit different, but, but not a whole lot. As far as the side chain concern, which determines what it sounds like, you know, you could think of the pulse width modulator as sort of the... Uh, raw material you have to work with, you know? And as long as that works well, then you have to feed that with the right control voltages from your signal to make it do what you want it to do. And that's the tricky part. So I let, I let Dave do the um, pulse width modulator because he already had experience doing that. But as far as the side chain was concerned, I, needed, I knew what I wanted that to, to do. I was looking for a particular characteristic. And one of the benefits of the pulse width modulator is that that is almost completely transparent. You cannot hear it working at all. And of course, you can make the side chain do all kinds of things that will make it very obvious, but the actual control element is very, very transparent. And it's, it's unusual in that in most compressors, as you increase the amount of compression, the distortion level goes up. It's sort of an inevitable consequence of the way most compression is done. But that doesn't happen with the pulse width modulator because the distortion level remains exactly the same, no matter how much compression you have. Now, you can make it sound distorted if you make a really short release time or attack time, but you know, any time that you're dealing with a signal that's um, uh, the frequency isn't uh, so low and the, where you have the attack and release set too, too fast, there'll be no distortion added by the um, gain reduction. So that was starting to sound pretty good, and I was fairly happy with that. And again, that was another one of those things with all the clip leads and clipping in all different values of stuff and experimenting. And I don't want to spend a lot of time explaining all, all the controls on this, but there is one really unusual control on here that's labeled harder and softer. And the reason why I labeled it that way is because I have no idea 
how to say in one word what this control does. <laughs> because essentially what it is is I came up with two different side chains that I, both of them I liked, but they had different characteristics. And I thought, well, maybe I'll just put a switch in there so people can switch between the two of them. But then I thought, you know, I wonder what would happen if you sort of blended some of the characteristics of this one with some of the characteristics of that one. So what I did was I put that control in, which is essentially a pan pot, you know, and you can pan between entirely one side chain or entirely the other side chain or any amount in between. And it varies so many things, there's just no way to describe it. I mean, it would, you'd have to take up a whole other panel just to explain what it's doing because it's not only changing the um, attack and release times, it's also changing the ratio, it's also changing the shape of the knee, the curve of the knee, um, and there's probably something else I'm forgetting, that, uh, that all vary as you change that control. So the only way you can really adjust that is by ear, you know, because it just depends on what you're looking for. Uh, so that's essentially the product line as it stands now. We have a few variations on this. We have a, um, a version, it's basically the VT2, but designed to have 70 dB again instead of 53 like the VT2. The 70 dB again is for uh, ribbon mics when you need to, that extra gain. And we also build a um, active DI that um, the original version of that was built in a uh, machined aluminum case. The case cost us $500 to make. <laughs> Not a practical product. We didn't sell very many of them because I couldn't make any money. I didn't have the heart to charge people more than $1,500 for the thing. <laughs> And, uh, you know, we didn't make any money on that at all. Uh, but I did repackage that as a rack mounted, which is a lot less expensive for the metal work. And that's the VT3. They're basically the same device. And so what we've done here tonight is we have um, some material that we're going to put through these. And what I'll do is um, adjust some things so you can hear what it does. And... I'd like to say before we start doing any of this stuff that what you're going to hear is my musical taste, you know, <laughs> about what I think things should sound like. And there's no reason why that should be what you like. Um, and so I hope there'll be an opportunity for some people to play around with this on their own. Um, but I think it's important to realize that, you know, we're all different. We're all individuals. If we all made everything, all our recording sound the same, it would really be a boring world. So it's important for everybody to do, you know, their own thing and um, develop your own style, you know. You know, over the years, I just always gravitate to the same kinds of sounds, you know. Sometimes I sort of stretch the limits and then feel kind of uncomfortable out there. <laughs> so I usually end up in the same spot. And uh, I think probably most of you, you know, would have some other direction you go. Well, this stuff's probably versatile enough that you can do that. So what we have here is a recording which um, is right now on the uh, half inch two track over there and we're running it through the um, VT7 compressor and out of that compressor into the VT5 EQ and uh, see, are we ready to roll that? Yep. Okay. Can I ask just one thing? Sure. Uh, the uh, facade of the uh, VU meters, the Art Deco design, uh -huh. is that pretty much like the Fairchild of VU? Um, well, you know, the, the first VU meters that we use, and if you look in that brochure on the VT1, that's the original VU meter we used, was made by Simpson. And that was a very common supplier for just about everybody back in the 50s and 60s. And um, they stopped making them. And I went to SciFam, which are these meters. And then they stopped making them. So now they're made by a company called Hoyt, which is actually in New Hampshire, and uh, that's who we use now. So we've had, over the years, we had to go through. I didn't even bother to look at the other, Yeah. 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 I think we're using the speakers in the back here. So for those of you that are sitting there to listen, you, you might want to turn around. We'll play a bit of this just.